Okay, guys. So I want to take this uh, this video here. This is example game two. Uh, we are still using the Smic control deck, and I just wanted to use this this game as a pretty good example of some of the the defensive tricks you can do with this deck. Just you know how you can hold on in a fast dagger or some kind of heavy creature coming your way. Just some of the tricks of the trade. So this is the opening hand. Not too bad. We will be able to play this coiling oracle on turn two. Um, we have the Tranquil Thicket. You will want to play that on turn one to make sure that it is untapped, and you can get that Oracle into play. And hope later on we get one of those Simic lands and we can return that to our hand and use it as a draw engine. Uh, you really don't want to use these as a mana source. Uh, do it if you have to, but the better thing is to have that, you know, going in the, the recursion with the card draw. So my opponent starts out with a Sandstone Needle. Now this is a card, it is typical in the, the competitive versions of the Storm decks. Um, there are some that use other lands, but it is definitely something you see with that. Something to keep aware of. Um, you won't always see that in the casual room. You will sometimes, but most often in a casual setting, it will be used for kind of a red deck wins scenario, goblin, something like that. Uh, they'll use something like the sandstone needle so they can use less mountains and bring in more red weenies. But not going to be a big issue. We do have a spreading seas in hand, and we can take care of that as soon as possible. Um, so Coiling Oracle is going to come down, and we ramp into a Thermokarst. Um, now, like I said, you want to take care of this as soon as possible. I still think it's more important to get that Oracle out. And, you know, next turn we have two options for getting rid of that. And you definitely want to get rid of it on the the, the following turn. Um, if we draw into a forest, we can destroy it and really screw our opponents. If not, the Spreading Seas will do the trick and we still get a draw off it. So my opponent is using it. He plays Kill and Fiend. Now, again, this is, uh, you know, kind of a setup that you do see in the Storm decks. I'm going to assume my opponent is not playing it. Um, if he is, you have a lot of options here. So Kiln Fiend, a lot of the times you will find in the red-blue decks is they use the blue as a draw engine and red to kind of ramp mana and continually play a whole bunch of little spells. You can pump up the Kiln Fiend to about a you know 20 power and swing through for the win. Now I have been beaten on this on turn two in Pauper. Um, it is a pretty powerful thing. Right now we're sitting pretty good. We have the Coiling Oracle, so we can jump block if he tries to do that. Um, he probably will at one point in time pump it up to maybe a 10 or just, you know, a really big number try and force me to jump block so that he can clear, sorry, he can clear my oracle out of the way and then pump it the rest of the way and finish me off. Uh, what he doesn't know is we do have Vapor Snag in hand. Um, you kind of want to hold that. You can use it. Uh, keep mana open every possible time. Um, you see here, I, I did not draw the second forest to play Thermokarst, but even if I did, I would use the Spreading Seas to get rid of the Needle. Um, this allows you to keep that mana open for Vapor Snag. Now, kind of an interesting you, it, oh, excuse me, an interesting thing you run into, uh, tripping over my own words here, with this matchup is the fact that your opponent um, has priority before you on the stack. And what do I mean by that? Um, if he is attacking, uh, he, you have the final say before combat damage is done. Um, you know, when it comes to him. If he does not take the opportunity to pump this Kiln Fiend, then he's only going to get through a one or two. If he plays any spell to pump this, you're going to have the second reaction to that. So, you know, say he plays, you know, even a, a Ponder, something like that. Oh, I'm sorry, Instant Speed, you know, it would be a Brainstorm. Um, if he plays that, Kiln Fiend and all goes on the stack. Now, you have the chance to respond to that. Um, and, you know, at that point in time, if you feel that he is too big for you to handle, then you can cast Vapor Snag. So anything he does to pump that, you will always have the second move. You will always be able to react to it. Um, that kind of makes Vapor Snag a, a great thing in this scenario. So if my opponent does pump him really big, we do block with the Oracle. And then he pumps the second time, we can use the Vapor Snag, as long as we leave this one mana available. So you'll see throughout this game that I, I leave that island open at all times. Um, this is another reason it's good to have that. He does play a um, Smoldering Spires, which will make it so my Oracle cannot jump block. So now I know that he is attempting to go off on this turn, so to say. Uh, his He is using the Mutagenic Growths. This is a great card that was added. He doesn't have to run green mana. He can play this for only two life, and that will um, pump the Kiln Fiend 2-2, and it's also getting the 3-0 off the ability. So, you know, once I can take it, you know, like, that's not so bad. He's going to be at, you know, 7 now. This will bring him to um, 9, 11. Um, at this point in time, that's going to be a bit much. I don't want to take that much damage. That's going to put me down to 9 life, and I'm going to be sitting not so great. So I will, you see, I have the priority before any of these things complete the stack. Um, and I will be able to cast the Vapor Snag after he attacks um, to prevent myself from going down to 9 life. 
Now, if it was something like 7, you would have that option. Um, I might take it to go to 13, but I think going down to 9 is just a bit too much for a deck that's running red. You know, they could have any, any number of um, burn spells in there that you really just don't want to be a part of. But another thing to, to remember now, um, that is returned to his hand, you do have the ability to rune snag. If he attempts to play this on his next turn, without dropping a fourth land, you will be able to cast this first rune snag. Um, let's open the graveyard while I say this. Um, you will be able to cast that first rune snag and prevent him from playing it, since he will only have one open mana available. Um, I always say the first rune snag is not as great because it's only two, um, but we do have that option anyways. Now you see here, um, before I drop a land, I am going to cycle the sandbar in hopes of, you know, maybe getting a forest. Now, if I get a forest at this point in time, let's let's ignore the fact that I didn't, but had I drawn a forest there, I would have had the option, I would have been able to play Thermokarst, I would have more than happily tapped out to destroy this red land. Um, that gives me the opportunity that he will miss the return drop on his Kiln Fiend. Um, he would have to top off a mountain or have it in hand to be able to get that Kiln Fiend into play. So, it, had I drawn a forest, I would play the Thermokarst, I would get rid of this red mana source. Um, I didn't, but that's why, you know, you want to make that play, you want to cycle this before making your land drop, just to see if you do get that card. So I'm going to just play an island swing for two with the Oracle. Um, and I, I have the mana open to attempt to counterspell. If he does play a fourth land, um, like he does here, I will not be able to use a rune snag, and I have two choices. I can either attempt to rune snag, uh, that will force him to tap out these last two lands and have no other play. Um, the Kilfeen will still come into hand, and it will start the ramp on my Rune Snag. Um, that that is one option you can go. Uh, you can also attempt to draw cards. At this point in time, I figure I have the Oracle. I'm okay to chump block a little bit. Um, I still have the option to destroy his Red Mana Source, which will um, slow down a lot of his burn spells. When you come to this deck, a lot of the the low costed spells are in red, so you want to be able to lock down that Red Mana as soon as possible. Um, so I will let that go. I will draw off the accumulated knowledge at the end of his turn, though. So you see here, I did get the, the forest I need. I ended up into a, a new Thermokarst. Um, I can tap out to play one of these and destroy that red mana source. And I still have mana open for a rune snag if I catch him um, casting with less than two mana open. Um, and we have the, the Thermokarst, the second one in hand. We can use that later on if he drops a new red mana source. Like I said, that's really what I want to lock down at this point in time. Um, he plays an island, so I'm going to not block with the, the Coiling Oracle. Um, I, I'm just going to take that chance being at 20 that he's not going to have, you know, he, he could have had two more growths in his hand and we could have been sitting in a not so great position. Um, but, you know, I'm, I decided to take that gamble. When he's sitting on only blue, he's not got a lot of options for instant speed. Um, if it was blue that he was casting, it's going to be like the, the brainstorms at those la low mana costs. So this turn, draw a Oracle. An Oracle? An Oracle. Um, we'll play that and see what we get. Let me top into a new Vapor Snag, so that's really great. Now we're sitting pretty. Um, we have two chump blockers for the Kiln Fiend, so he cannot just play a land to prevent my blocking. Um, I, I will be able to still chump block, and I have the Vapor Snag in hand to handle that Kiln Fiend. And at this point in time, he's really... You know, his deck may not be totally screwed, uh, you know, assuming most good decks will have a, a secondary plan, but if his main focus is, you know, the Kiln Fiends, as it may be in the casual room, then I'm sitting pretty good. I have the, the two extra counter spells in hand, I have the Vapor Snag, and he's got no red mana, so, you know, this is this is pretty well in my favor at this point in time. Um, he's going to attack, I'm not going to jump block. Um, like I said, anything he plays to pump that, I'm going to have second priority, and we'll be able to cast the Vapor Snags to kill it. Uh, so, you know, he's going to just swing for one, knowing that I can do that. Now we, we do luck into our Simic Growth Chamber, we can play that. Now when you do it, just make sure you see here, before um, this you know goes onto the stack officially, uh, that triggers, and in response you're going to tap this land for the green mana. This way you do not have to tap your, your other green mana source. If you tap this green, you're losing one mana, so you might as well you want to tap this, so that when that's returned to hand, you can use the mana that it produced to cycle itself, um, is more, more or less the way that's going to go. And this does net us a new oracle. We're of course going to play, and we're sitting good again. We have another jump blocker. Um, at this point in time, you could uh, leave two oracles open to block and kill the fiend. Um, unless he plays a growth, the uh, triggered ability on the fiend only bumps up his attack power. So you know it's it's going to need a growth to save it from two oracles. 
Um, you see we review, revealed a drake. Um, we're going to now use one of these oracles to block at every opportunity possible. At this point in time, I'm going to attack with two. He's going to think that he is free and clear to attack. Uh, hopefully he makes the mistake is what you want at this point. You want him to attack so you can chump block and you can get this drake into play. Um, if he does you know, have a land to stop it from blocking, you have the vapor snag. You also have a rune snag in hand to kind of you know, match any, any issue that may arise. Um, so we see here he does make the mistake. He does attack with the kill and fiend, um, allowing me to chump block with the oracle. Um, the oracle will die and now I will be able to play the drake on my following turn. You see I also get the cartographer. Um, that's going to be great because we have a sandbar and a thicket in hand. Let's get rid of that. Um, so I will be able to bring those back and cycle them. Uh, at this point in time, I you know swing with these two. Um, you have the option you can leave this man open and play defensive so that you have uh, a counterspell ability, um, or you could attempt to play the the cartographer. He still knows that you have the vapor snag, so you don't really you know gain anything from that. Um, if he did not know you had the Vapor Snag, you could play the Cartographer, um, and then he would realize you had it if you did not cycle the Lonely Sandbar. Um, if you leave one blue mana open and do not cycle the card that he knows you have to cycle, then he's going to know that you have some other option, whether it's a Vapor Snag or a Force Spike. So just something to keep in mind uh, when you're playing this deck. Um, you know, you just want to be aware of that, that he's going to know if you do not cycle it. So, you know, when you play the Cartographer, expect to cycle it unless you are tapped out. Um, you know, or else he's going to know you have something else in hand to play. Uh, it's always, you know, a gamble. It's like playing poker. You want to kind of bluff your hand a little bit. Um, the less they know about your hand, the better off you are. That's that's kind of why I hate seeing the, the pro over cards that let your opponent to see your hand, because that really puts you at a disadvantage, especially, you know, I like to play a lot of control and, and counter control and stuff like that. And that's, that's a real drawback. So we drew a Spreading Seas. We're sitting pretty good. Um, he plays this Stream Hopper. Uh, he can use that to chump block the Drake at some point in time. Um, even possibly pump it out if he gets the growths. Um, but we do have a Spreading Seas, the, the Thermokarst. If he does play another red land, I am holding on to those at this point in time, though, until that, that land comes about. So we're going to play the Cartographer. Um, it really, at this point in time, doesn't matter which one you choose to cycle. I do choose um, to get the Thicket. Uh, so I can leave all three blue mana sources open. It honestly wouldn't matter because the rune snag costs one and a, a blue, um, and that colorless would allow you to use it. So we got another spreading seas. Um, if you do have the opportunity to play one of these on an island, it's still a card draw. Um, you know, it's it's not a great thing, but it's a little better than having dead cards in your hand. You know, I, I will play them on my island or his island. It really doesn't matter. Just to get that, that one draw, if really necessary. So we're attacking with the Drake. It's the only thing that's going to get through. Um, he hasn't blocked with the Hopper yet, but he still has the, the time to do so. Um, so we're just going to, you know, every turn, we're going to attack with these two because they will get through both of his creatures. If he chooses the block, great. If not, no big loss. Um, you see, he finally did get down a new mountain. Um, kind of the the red man has been eva evading him at this point in time, but we have three answers to that in our hand, and that's going to be the first thing I addressed on my turn. Um, he plays here the assault strobe, giving that creature double strike. Um, that's a great card to play with the kill and fiend. Uh, it will make him a four-two double striker just with that card alone. Uh, but we do have a number of chump blockers. Remember, with double strike, it's going to first strike first. So don't. Um, attempt to block with two or the cartographer uh, to kill it because it's going to hit first. So if you put up these two against it, they're going to die and he's going to live. So you may, if you do, um, if you do play a block with the oracle, um, then you know it's just just do one. It's not trampling. It's just going to kill it first. Um, that way you're only you're trading one card away for the damage. So drawing an island, you know, good, not great. Um, at this point in the game, you're gonna, you know, you want to see more of those like terramorphics to kind of siphon out those lands. So we're going to spreading seas on his mountain. You know, clearly he's holding on to cards that have red in them because he cannot play it. Then we get a counter spell. You know, we're sitting pretty again. Um, he still has the option to jump block with the hopper at some point in time, but the the cartographer. You know, here's another thing I I should have done there is I should have attacked with the oracle. Um, I do have the vapor snag in hand, 
Um, by attacking with the Oracle, I would have um, won the game or forced him to block. Uh, and, you know, even further, what I should have done is play the Vapor Snag, targeting the Hopper um, to try and bounce it from his hand so I could attack through for the win. Uh, you really do have to kind of play for the win. You can't just sit here and, and play even partially defensive. Um, you know, you you got to be an aggressive player in this game. Um, sometimes it'll bite you in the ass, but, you know, it's it's really a necessity, in my opinion, at least. So he's not going to attack this time. He knows that he needs the block to get through. Um, you can see I, I make several small mistakes in this point in time in the game. Um, here I'm going to attack again with the Drake and the Cartographer. Another stupid play, I should have attacked with the Oracle, um, because he would have only been able to block two of these three creatures and it would have been game over. Uh, these aren't exactly costly mistakes. Uh, if this was tournament play, it might be a little more costly by eating time off the clock. Um, you know, and, and if his deck was a little stronger, maybe he would have an answer. But if he chump blocks at this point in time and does nothing else, uh, then it's just game over and I'm just kind of delaying things. So he gets the hopper flying. Uh, we'll use that to, to block the drake and the fiend, the cartographer. Um, he does not get any other plays, so it's going to be game over. Um, on his turn, I, I'm not sure there's any card he could get at this point to save him, red or otherwise. Um, you know, it's, we're sitting here with three. If he plays, you know, two creatures, he's dead. If he plays one creature, he's dead. He needs to play, you know, multiple creatures. Needs to take care of those three. Um, and we do draw a new cartographer. We can play that, and we are we're sitting pretty good, even if he, had, you know, cleared off those creatures. Um, but you know, we don't waste time. You don't want to fool around. It's it's very disrespectful, in my opinion, when you have the game one to sit there and keep playing spells. Um, so we're gonna go right to attacker's phase. Um, and attack, and if he does have some answer to this, then we can play cards in the the main phase. You know, that's just my my personal, uh, you know, feelings on the games. I, I feel it's very disrespectful when you have the game, you know, one already to to sit there and just play a whole bunch of spells. That it's really unnecessary. Um, you see, I, I make another mistake and misclick here and do not attack with the cartographer. But again, doesn't really matter. Um, I'm going to be able to swing in for the win. So there you go, that's just a, a look at this deck and, and kind of some of the defensive things you can do with the, the vapor snags and the, the land control against, um, you know, non-cloud posts and, and non-ravnica decks.